Welcome back to our series of videos explaining the ins and outs of PWGL, a computer-assisted composition software program. We're going to continue today with a second part of explaining the ins and outs, or at least the basics, of ENP, the expressive notation package, and how that ties in with how you would algorithmically describe things in PWGL. So at the end of the last video, we had one measure, a 4-4, four, four, um, I think with a half note and three-quarter note triplets in it. And I want to just go on a little bit more to talk about how to add some details to your score. And I have over here a list of things to try, and hopefully we'll do most of these. So in PWGL and ENP, the numerator of your time signature is generally created by the program itself. It just looks how many beats are in the measure, and that's where the numerator is. So here we have a measure of 1-4 right now. And if I wanted to make that a measure of 4-4, four, four, I would have to actually tell ENP what to do with the other three beats in the measure. And that's really completely unnecessary, but um, what the heck, let's just do it. I'm going to double click on this text box object and open it up. And this is the actual code for my score here. Uh, we showed this last time, but I'll just review. Um, the score is a hierarchical uh, set of lists inside of lists, and each list is sort of um, denoted by an open and close parenthesis, and what is inside that list um, are the items of the list. Uh, so it's, uh, they're nested lists, sort of like the old Russian Matryoshka dolls. So the outermost layer of the list is the score. There's a set of parentheses that indicate the entire score. I do not show them here in this um, text file because the text box object adds that uh, outer layer whenever you evaluate it. So um, if I go down here, select the text box and hit B to evaluate and then hit Command B to bring up my output window, you can see there, this crazy thing here, right there, that is the actual final score object to create this measure of 1-4 with one quarter note in it at middle C. And it has, you can stop and count if you want, but it has added an extra set of outer parentheses there. So now going back into the score, there's uh, inside every score are one or more parts, and this is the part level. Note how I can click on the outside of a parenthesis, and it shows me the matching param. That's really great um, for debugging your, your uh, code in your parts. Each part is made up of one or more voices. Each voice uh, constitute as um, holds one or more measures. There's also a way to do non-mensural, um, like spatial notation in uh, PWGL, but I'm just not going to get into that now. Each measure can contain one or more beats. So right now there's one beat here, and that beat contains one event. In PWGL, if you want to turn any event into a rest, you just um, add a minus sign before to make it a negative number. So I'm now taking this one beat, which is currently a quarter note at middle C, and I am going to make it uh, a, a, a rest, a quarter note rest. So if I evaluate my score, uh, there it is, quarter note rest. All right. Now let's go back into the text itself of our score. Now, in the long run, what we want to do is use PWGL programming to create these scores for us. We don't want to go in and hand type them all. Um, what I'm doing now is really pedagogical. I want you to see and understand the structure because I think that'll make it much easier later when you're trying to build these things automatically using the power of PWGL. So hang in there. And in fact, um, I, I like really building by, them by hand, even with PWGL, which we'll talk about more when we get into those uh, the constructor objects. Okay, so let's say actually I do want this to be a note, so I'm going to take away that negative sign. So now, suppose I want to take my quarter note um, at middle C and transpose it. I want to change this pitch. So what I need to do is alter the single note event here. Note events default to a pitch of middle C. If you don't specify a pitch, it uh, uses the pitch middle C, but I want to specify a pitch. So that means I need to specify more information about this one note event. And in order to do that, um, I need to put it in a wrapper to say I'm adding some things here, and I need to enclose it so that um, PWGL knows that all the things I add are part of this specific little note event. So I add one layer of wrapper here for the, um, the sort of chord level of the score um, inside of the beat and I will add the keyword notes to say we're adding a pitch to this note. And in PWGL, it follows 
a pitch naming convention derived from MIDI. So um, the integers from 0 to 127 and even higher um, each indicates one half step along the scale, chromatic scale, with um, 60 being middle C. So, and 48 being an octave below that, 72 being the C above middle C, etc., etc. So if I went the D one whole step above middle C, I type 62. All right, so now I've entered that in parentheses after the keyword notes. I'm double checking my parentheses here to make sure they balance. So I have my one beat, which now contains uh, one note event, and inside that one note event is one note, um, and that note has the pitch 62. Okay, let's try to evaluate this and see what happens. There we go. So, if perchance I wanted this to be a harmony or an interval um, and not just a single pitch, I could just hit space after the 62 and add another pitch. Let's say I want to have an F above that D and um, let's say uh, an E above that. Um, so I know 72 is the octave above 60, so 70, <laughs> um, 76 would be the E above there. Okay, so now I'm going to go back over here. Select, oops, sorry. In, in uh, PWGL, if you double click on the um, surface of your patch space, you can actually type in the function names for the objects you're looking for, and it defaults to um, Lisp objects. So if I wanted the Lisp object plus, I could just hit OK here. This is a digression, obviously. Um, if I double click on the space and type, I don't know, and type, say, round, and I want the Lisp round object, um, it creates it. Okay, but we don't need that now. All right, so let's evaluate this and see uh, what our three pitches are. R, S, and D. Oh, and maybe I made this explicit last time, but you can also play by just hitting space bar when the score editor is selected. Now, I can go into this score object, and I can zoom um, by stretching my uh, trackpad, or you can uh, scroll your mouse wheel, assuming you have a mouse wheel, and I can actually edit this chord, too, by hand. I could select the pitches and hit up and down arrows on my computer keyboard to change e any of these pitches and do all kinds of nifty things in here. Uh, if I want to hear them all, I have to deselect that one. But when I evaluate the score again, it will overwrite any manual editing I've done. Okay, so that's important to know. Okay, let's say now I want to add something to my measure and have not just one, one four bar with one quarter note, but add some other event. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that I want to add um, three measures of rest. Okay, I'm going to add one more event to my score here. And inside of that event, I will say uh, I want um, one rest. Okay, so now let's see what this does. I'm saying, actually, I'm indicating here that this is one beat currently. So if I evaluate this, I should just give it one quarter note of rest added to my measure. Yes. If I wanted to make that um, a dotted half note of rest, I change that to a three, reevaluate, and now I have three beats of rest. Okay, let's say actually I want to have um, one beat of rest and then one beat where another note happens. Okay, so I'm going to copy this and add in one more beat here. And let's say um, this structure should work, but I'm just going to test it. All right, so now this notice this new pitch defaults to middle C because I haven't specified a pitch yet. But just as I did earlier, I can go in and say notes and then specify a pitch. Let's say 75 and 71. Why not? Okay. And let me evaluate this. Oops. Okay, that error happened because I forgot. Notice we have to add a s added layer of wrapping here whenever we actually add pitches to our notes. So I have to go back here and say now this uh, one beat event is going to have a list of items inside and the first of that list of items is this one note event that has two pitches. Now this should work. There we go. Okay. All right, so great. So uh, now we have a 3-4 measure and if I wanted to add one more beat of rest 
Um, this is getting a little bit uh, visually not so exciting, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to respace this. It's not necessary, but I like the, to space them this way so that um, you can actually sort of see the hierarchy um, pretty easily uh, when you're um, uh, doing your, your stuff. So now we have one beat, one beat, one beat, and we'll see now. If I want to add another beat, I'll follow the same template. One beat. And if I want to make it another rest, I can just uh, copy what I did for the second one of these. And that will now give me one four four measure with an event, a rest, another event, and another rest. OK, great. All right. Um, we did subdivisions of beats uh, in the last video. Um, but let's just try to do that a little bit here, just for the heck of it, OK? Um, Let's say um, for this second um, event here, I want this actually to be two eighth notes, not just um, one quarter note. Well, here I have inside my one beat's worth of space one event right now, which is a note. So what I need to do is add a second event inside of this space here. All right. OK, so to add a note here, first of all, I want to look at the structure of the current note. OK, I have this wrapper, which is my list of all my notes. And inside, I have uh, one note here. So I'm going to try to duplicate that structure here by going after that first note's parenthesis and adding another event. And let's start by just making it look just about the same as the previous one. I'll maybe give it a different pitch, maybe only one pitch. But it is indeed a second note. OK, let's evaluate. And there we go. So now we have two eighth notes in the space of that beat. So here is the beat. And notice if I double click on that end paren, it highlights everything inside of that parenthesis. So now we have a wrapper for the beat. And inside of the beat, there is one note with these, uh, really, a technically a chord event um, that contains two individual pitches and a second one that contains one pitch. We've taken that single space of time, which is this represented by um, this first one out here, and now we've put two things in it. And um, PWGL assumes that they're equally spaced because they're given the same weighting. Now, if I would, say, take the first one of those two and change it from a 1 to a 2, watch what happens. We reevaluate. And now we have a triplet with a 2 to 1 ratio of the values inside that triplet. Okay, So maybe we'll do one more thing and then stop for today. And that is, what if we want to have a, a nested tuplet? Um, uh, there are composers like Brian Fernyhoe who are using PWGL and just love the nesting of tuplets. So let's see if we can create one. All right, what I'm going to do is take this second attack here of that triplet and try to turn it into um, two uh, sixteenth notes uh, inside that triplet space. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, so first of all, right now we have a space of one with one note in it. The first thing we know we're going to have to do is divide the space, right? So um, I'm going to put a extra set of parentheses outside of this and say this is the one that we're now dividing. Okay, and inside of that there's this one note, and uh, let's just, for the sake of fun, um, copy that and paste in second, and we'll give this a different. Um, pitch value. Okay. Now, because these two are units of this one, I'm going to put another layer of wrapping around both of those, the duo, um, to indicate that they are a list of items with these two items inside, which are the sublist of this one item here. Okay, let's see what it is. Okay, it doesn't look beautiful, but this is indeed exactly what we want. The spacing issues are something I'm not going to get into today, but we've created um, a tuplet, we've put a uh, sub-tuplet inside of that tuplet, and really having nested tuplets further and further um, are just sort of doing exactly this process at smaller and smaller levels. As you might imagine, keeping track of all the parentheses becomes quite difficult, and that's why I like to visually nest things, which I haven't done uh, here um, right now, and I won't bother because of the sake of time but that's uh, definitely possible. Okay, 
So some of these things uh, which we have not done yet, such as adding expressions, instrument name, tempo, adjusting the meter, we'll do in our next video. I think that's it for today, and um, see you next time.